So today we're talking about quantum theory, uh, which is the currently accepted model of the atom, but I want you to uh, understand our limitations as people trying to describe the world around us. And no matter how good our theory is, it's never going to be perfect. So we will still have limitations. However, you don't need to write any of this Bohr theory down, but just to kind of reset the stage and put this back into context. Bohr talked about specific energy levels. Very, very important concept in quantum theory as well. And in the Bohr atom, no, you don't have to draw that, uh, atoms that had these orbits, our energy levels, the electrons in those atoms could move from a lower energy level to a higher energy level if they absorbed a specific amount of energy. They would then consequently fall back down to that lower energy level or to some lower energy level, dumping the excess energy in the form of light. So we had these different colors of light coming out uh, when we observed excited atoms and the light that came out from that. If we separated the light into components, we got very, very specific lines of energy. That was the line spectra. There were some implications of Bohr's theory, and this is one of the places where, again, you don't have to write this down, but where uh, Bohr's theory I'm going to use the phrase falls apart, where it doesn't do a very good job of explaining. Uh, number one is that what it meant was that electrons at higher energy levels had to be moving at faster speeds so that they could get around the, the orbit. Second thing is that it meant that we should be able to calculate both the speed of the electron, if we know its energy, and how far away from the uh, nucleus it should be if it's in this nice circular orbit. So we had some things that were very, very quantifiable. Uh, and then also the radius of the orbit should be fairly fixed because as soon as the radius changed, then the, then the, uh, the, the energy should be changing as well and we should be able to figure that out. Now, the thing about Bohr theory is that um, it worked for certain atoms or we were able to use it for certain atoms. Um, one of the things we knew about Bohr theory or we were able to use with Bohr theory is this idea that in an, an orbit, there's a maximum number of electrons. It's 2n squared, where n is the orbit number. The problem was the order of fill. So particularly when you get from elements number 17, 18, 19, 20 to 21, things kind of fell apart. And if you think about the periodic table, that was chlorine, argon, which finish off the third row, uh, potassium, calcium, which start the fourth row. Now, you were able to use the periodic table to figure things out, but we couldn't use Bohr theory to explain how the electrons fill those atoms. And if you don't really remember that stuff, don't worry about it, because we're not going to be using it. The other thing about Bohr theory is that it works really, really, really well for hydrogen, but only for hydrogen. Once you get into more uh, atoms with more electrons, it, it really doesn't work very well at all. And that's a bit of a problem. So we're going to have a theory that does a little bit better job. OK, quantum theory. This is where we want to start writing things down. Not everything, because there's a lot of stuff that uh, it's not really going to be helpful for us. So it is currently accepted. That part you don't need to write down, although you might want to know that it is currently accepted model of the atom. It uses something called wave particle duality, which was, at its time, a revolutionary, highly controversial idea that said that small particles, these are things that have mass and they're made of stuff, they can behave like waves. And at the time, scientists thought that waves were waves and particles were particles and waves were just energy and particles uh, could have energy in, in kinetic form, but they couldn't behave like waves. So it was a very, very revolutionary idea. It also means that tr traditional rules of physics don't apply. So once we get down into a very, very small scale, a lot of the things that we know that particles do, they're not going to do that anymore. It's also, and this is going to be our problem, it's a highly mathematical model, which means it's going to be extremely difficult for us to draw a picture of the atoms. So we're going to have new ways of representing our atoms. OK, some other things that are involved. Something called Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Now, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle basically says that we cannot figure out the exact position and speed and momentum of the electron, partly because whatever we do to find it, we're going to change it. So we're all, we, the electron is, we don't know where it is. We can figure out where it's probably going to be, but we can't figure out where it is. So this concept of fixed radius orbits, gone. So we come up with this. I shouldn't say we, because I had nothing to do with it, but this is where we're at that we have an area or volume, because we're talking three dimensions, of probability. 
Now we're going to have a name for that, which is kind of unfortunate because it's similar to our concept of, similar to our word for orbit, but an orbital is not a circular ring. It's going to be a volume, a three-dimensional space where we're probably going to find the electron, but not for sure. Okay, we talk about atomic orbitals. So these atoms have orbitals and the electrons are going to be in orbitals. Well, what's an orbital? Well, it's going to be different kinds of orbitals, different orbitals are going to be from different waveforms. Now, if I look at this picture, now I don't have to draw that down, but if you look at those things, all of those waves, different forms of waves, have something in common. They all fit within the same two left and right boundaries. And what that will give to us is different shapes of probability. So I'm going to show you some different shapes and I probably just want you to write down the titles and, or maybe a quick little sketch of something. So we have S orbitals and that's a letter designation that we use. We'll also have a number def designation for that. S orbitals are spherical. The S doesn't stand for spherical, but we can kind of think of it that way because it works. But you'll notice in the bottom picture here, each little dot represents the chances of finding an electron. Now, I don't have very many electrons in there. It's just that I might find it here or there or there or there or somewhere else. You'll notice that as I get farther away from the nucleus, I'm less likely to find the electron. But there's still some probability of finding it. So you'll notice that my orbital shape is not well defined at all. It's overall kind of round, but it just sort of fades out. And then we have P orbitals. And the P does not stand for propeller shaped, but you can kind of think of it that way because it works. The thing about the P orbital, these three pictures here are different orbitals of the same type. So I can have an orbital oriented left and right. Actually, the first one you see is in out. I can have one that's oriented left, right, and one that's oriented up, down. And they are separate orbitals. So any electrons in one will not be in the other, even if they sort of overlap in the same nucleus. Uh, they're not, they are separate orbitals. There's d orbitals. We're not going to worry about trying to draw those. We're not going to figure out what the d stands for. I used to say double dumbbell, but that doesn't sound very smart either. Uh, and it doesn't fit that one in the, in the top with the donut in the middle. So D doesn't stand for donut in the middle either. But the point is, different waveforms are going to give us different probabilities, and we can sort of start to map out the probability of finding the electron, and it starts to take that kind of shape. And then we have these F orbitals, and please don't even attempt to draw those. But the idea is, once you have a computer that can draw those, these are what come out. Well, what do we use to, to get the, uh, the pictures? I'll show you that in a minute. So only certain wavelengths are allowed, only certain wavelengths are possible. So it's not like we started out saying we only have certain energies. We don't have the option because if I were to take, uh, say, the, the, the right side limit here and move it, neither of those waves fit, neither of those waves are possible. So this is where specific energies sort of falls out of quantum theory rather than us putting it in. Okay, so we describe the electron energy, mostly energy, by using these quantum numbers. And the quantum numbers come from something called the Schrodinger wave equation, and you don't need to write this down unless you're a real masochist, but here's the Schrodinger wave equation. Now, each one of these symbols, well, not each one, some of these symbols actually are an entire equation all to themselves. No. But what it basically comes down to is what is the probability of finding an electron in the y direction, x direction, z direction, and then there's some other stuff in there, and that's fine. In order to solve that equation, you need a lot of smarts. You need a big computer, and you need three quantum numbers. So we're going to work through the three quantum numbers. We're actually going to have four quantum numbers because we're extra special. No, something else. But we're going to have four quantum numbers. Three of them are required in order to solve the equation. The first one is called n, principal quantum number looks suspiciously like the n value from Bohr theory. And it kind of serves the same purpose. It does, we do call it the energy level, and it does describe the energy of the electron. It is similar to the old orbit number, but we don't want to use that terminology. The closer, sorry, the smaller the n value, the more likely you are to find the electron close to the nucleus. Not guaranteed, but more likely. 
And the values are the simple quant counting numbers like you would have had in the Bohr theory, one, two, three, four, and so on. This is where things get a little bit different with L, the orbital, the orbital number. Now, I use a script L just so that it doesn't look like a one or something else, but it's an L. We call the sub-energy level. And with the sub-energy level, that's going to describe the shape of the probability distribution. So you remember the S, P, D, and F orbitals, those different shapes? Those would be determined by these values of L. And the values of L kind of depend on the value of N. I shouldn't say kind of, but they depend on the value of N. So L starts at zero and works its way up to as high as N minus one. So in other words, if N is equal to three, L could be zero, one, or two. And then we'll sometimes, instead of numbers, we'll designate these as letters, which we hinted at earlier. So S, P, D, F actually correspond to the zero, one, two, three values of L. Next quantum number that's required by the Schrodinger wave equation is the magnetic quantum number, M subscript L. I'll just call it M sub L most of the time. That's going to talk about the orientation, or that's going to tell us the orientation. So remember those S orbitals or the P orbitals that were up, down, left, right, in, out? That comes out of M sub L. The number of different possible values will be the number of different possible orientations. So we saw one that had three orientations, one that had five orientations, and if you count up the F orbitals, F orbitals, those had seven. We don't need to know that, but we do need to come up with these possible values. They run from negative L up to positive L. So if L is negative two, negative two, one, negative one, zero, one, two, from negative L up to positive L. The last one, which is not required by the quantum, sorry, the Schrodinger wave equation, but is required by something else, it actually recognizes the, the particle nature. And it also allows the electrons to form pairs that have different quantum numbers. Same orbital, same sub-energy level, same uh, orientation, but now a different spin on them. So then we use possible values of plus one half or minus one half. I suppose that's somewhat arbitrary because it's not like it's half of anything, but plus one half or minus one half. The kind of question that you're gonna be seeing at least to start it's going to look like this. Write the possible quantum numbers for an electron in the fourth energy level or fifth energy level or something like that. And you've got four quantum numbers. You have n. Well, if it tells you the energy level, there's your value of n. L starts at zero and goes up as high as n minus one, but it will always start at zero. M sub L goes from the negative L up to the positive L. And M sub S is just plus one half or minus one half. Now, believe it or not, out of this, all of the electrons that are possible in the fourth energy level will select their numbers so that each electron has a unique set of four quantum numbers. It's, it's actually easier to work with than it seems like at this point. Okay, this picture comes from a famous thought experiment called the Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger's cat. A uh, bit of a weird story. If we have time in class, we'll talk about it, or I'll just point you to a video. Basically, it was correspondence between Schrodinger and Einstein about whether or not this is possible. Eh, eh. Anyway, talk to in class, we'll use the quantum theory, we'll use it to explain properties, we'll use it to explain behaviors, we'll use it in the same way that we used Bohr theory in a previous course. And we'll talk to you then. See you.